Um, but welcome back nonetheless. My name is Jay, volunteer with Nefesh Benefesh. I myself made Aliyah with them just over 15 years ago. And here at Cafe Ole, we go over the everyday Hebrew you need here in Israel to succeed. Whether that is um, paying your bills and how to read your bills, how to go to the grocery store and shop, how to keep up with the news, strike up a conversation, flirt, whatever it may be. Um, we would love to hear from you what topics you'd like us to cover. Please write to Nefesh Benefesh or write it in the chat window below, um, as this is really meant to be user-friendly. We really want this to be Hebrew that you can use in real time. Um, we have this lesson and then two more before we break for Pesach aka Passover, and then we'll be back for our spring and summer session afterwards. Um, and we are going to take the next few weeks um, to do some of the, again, lessons that you have requested to do, um, both getting ahead of Pesach, but also a few others. So some quick housekeeping. Again, apologies for the delay in starting. Um, Second, uh, last week's session, I believe, is not yet up in on YouTube. Again, apologies for that. I will check in and have Nefesh Benefesh um, check in with that as well. Um, if you have any questions about what we're going to go through in this lesson, please write it in the Q&A window. Everything else in the chat window. I'm not going to be looking at the chat window because that is not about today's class. There are currently 150 of you on this call. There's just me, so thank you in advance for following along with that. Um, right, so let's get started with today. Today, we're going to talk about food. We've talked about food quite a lot. We're going to keep talking about food because it's Israel, it's Jews, it's the Middle East. There's always plenty to talk about food. And obviously, as we get closer to Pesach, we're going to talk even more about food with regards to that holiday and things that you may not be used to um, uh, for Pesach, for the holiday um, in Israel, as opposed to being abroad. There are some very unique traditions here, including the first diaspora-based holiday that's now an official national holiday in Israel, which also has to do a lot with food. But today we're going to talk about food. Um, we've done grocery shopping. We've done grocery shopping online. We've done nutritional labels. We are going to talk a little bit more about foodstuffs. And we've talked about grilling, by the way. Um, we have, we're going to talk a little bit more about specific foodstuffs. And in the chat window, I'm going to be posting some links that are really important for you um, for us to be covering this list. They'll also be up on the YouTube um, when uh, video, when it goes up online, you just type in Cafe Ole or Nefesh Benefesh, you'll see all of our uh, previous lessons there. Okay, so with that, I'm going to post here in the chat. Just make sure that it all works carefully before I post it and go through it and explain what I'm talking about before we get to today's list of words. Okay, so um, as I've mentioned before, the internet is a wonderful thing. And as opposed to when I made Aliyah 15 plus years ago, even with a good amount of Hebrew, there were a lot of things I don't understand. And there are probably things I still don't understand. For example, the various different kinds of fish. That is something I'm never going to memorize. And thankfully someone has compiled all the different types of fish that are available for sale and consumption here in Israel and found the Hebrew version of those names. Same thing with cuts of meat. Remember in Israel, cuts of meat are different than in the UK and the US and Canada and elsewhere. Um, the different kinds of cheeses and dairy products are there, um, as well as another topic we're gonna get to shortly. Um, what we're gonna do today is talk about dairy products that are harder to find an understanding of by just learning Hebrew, let alone looking online. Um, this comes from a conversation, uh, excuse me, a request that someone had that we go over, and it also opens up some really good uh, vocabulary in general we should have. Um, so as always, I'm going to open up today's vocab list. If you have any, um, again, questions with regards to this lesson, please write in the Q&A. Everything else, please keep in the chat. Let me open it up. Just one second. There we go. Okay. So as always, Hebrew is in the middle. Transliteration on the right-hand side. 
English on the left, any notes, we'll go through all these words together, don't worry. So like I said, we're gonna talk about um, very specific food stuff in Israel with regards to dairy products. We're not gonna go through the basic words, okay? We're not going through um, the real basics. We're gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive because um, if you go into any grocery store or any supermarket in Israel, there's gonna be a whole swath of dairy products you're probably not familiar with, or they're not laid out in the same way you thought, or there is quite a lot of diversity of one product and not so much of another. If not, it doesn't exist at all. We're gonna go through as many of those as possible. Um, what I put in that list of, um, in the chat window, are a number of really helpful links of all the different things. The last one in there has to do with something in that's in row two here in the vocab. Row two here is pikuach memshalti. Okay, pikuach in modern Hebrew means supervision. Memshalti comes from the word memshal or memshala, which means government. And this is simply the governmental, it's the adjective of it. So governmental price control. Pikuach refers to those things that the government either subsidizes or regulates its price, okay? So when you go to the grocery store, you will often see next to the items that are government subsidized or government controlled price-wise, it'll have a sign on it that will say pikuach memshalti or something along the lines using those words to make it clear this price is fixed. So whether you're going to the most expensive of places or the cheapest of places, if this is a specific product that's approved by the government for price control, it will be priced accordingly. There is no um, jacking up the price when it comes to very specific foodstuffs. That link that I provided in the chat window gives you those very specific items, okay? So you can look them up. Why we're going through that here and why specifically dairy, if you look, half the products, there's, there's a number of 21 products there foodstuffs, um, and half of them are dairy. Okay, so it's a really big amount. And whether you are on a budget, whether you've never thought about food being price controlled, it's an important part of Israel's reality. Okay, um, in terms of socioeconomics, in terms of home economics, whatever it may be, it's important to know, not just that there are these 21 products under government price control, and that 11 of them are dairy products, but what are those 11 products and not to mention what are the other 10? You can look at the full list. We're gonna go through some of them here today. So we're gonna start with a simple one, chalav. Okay, row three here. Chalav means milk, pretty straightforward. Um, what is important though, and you're gonna see this pattern again and again in today's lesson, is that um, many of the words that we use are the same shoresh or shoresh, the same three letters that make the root of the word. We talk about this every week because it's that important to understand Hebrew, are used again and again to um, create new words or to create words that are interlinked. What do I mean by that? So if our word is chalav, right? Dairy, milk. From chalav, we get the word chalavi. Chalavi, whenever we've talked about this before, when you add a yud, to the end of a uh, noun, specifically a masculine noun, it becomes an adjective. It's a really simple, um, cost-effective, if you will, way of creating new words in Hebrew. This is also common in other Semitic languages. We're only learning Hebrew though, but it's still important to know. So from chalav, if we attach that yud at the end, it becomes chalavi, and chalavi means milk-like. It literally means milk-like or milkish. But in everyday English, it's dairy. Okay, chalavi means dairy. Many of you who keep kashrut, you already knew that. But in Hebrew, chalavi means dairy. So anything that is dairy, meaning it contains dairy products, is chalavi. That is the word that we use. Chalavi, by the way, in slang, means something boring. Right? Think about it, um, those of you who have gone out um, I'm not knocking um, dairy restaurants, what we call here in Israel, restaurants that are kosher and only serve dairy products, i.e. not meat. Um, but in slang in modern Hebrew, chalavi means boring. It just is. If you like dairy restaurants, it's no, or dairy food, it's not a personal attack on you. It's the slang that we use here in Israel. Chalavi is just 
bland, boring. Think as white as milk. It's kind of boring. From that same root, chet lamed bet, right? That we get chalav, we get chalavi. We also get the word chelbon. We've talked about this before when we went through nutritional labels. Um, chelbon means protein. So for those of you, it's important to know how many grams of protein you are getting in a serving of something. When you look at the nutritional label, you're looking for this word here in row five, chelbon. Okay, protein. Very important word. Okay, let's move on. Like I said, gvina, I don't want to go through all these words. These are kind of boring. Gvina, we know, right? Cheese. But in Israel, just like in other countries, we have quite an array of cheeses. Um, we love our dairy products here in Israel. Whether we or not we can um, healthfully consume them is a different story, but gvina is a, and gvinot cheeses, the plural of it is a big part of our staple of our diet. Um, it's important to, like I said, this isn't just about the basic things. We need to go a little bit deeper. So, gvina kasha versus gvina raka. Gvina kasha is a hard cheese. Kasha is the root, is the adjective kashe, masculine. Kasha, in this case, feminine, because it's gvina, which is also feminine. Kasha means difficult, but it also means hard. In this case, a hard cheese, okay? You all know what that is. If you don't, please look it up. I'm not gonna explain that here, but thank you for thinking I would. Um, versus a gvina raka. Raka, or raka, depending on how you say the letter resh, means soft in this context. A soft cheese is a gvina raka. Um, rach usually means tender, okay? So gil, ha gil ha rach means the tender age or young age. This is often describing babies and toddlers and young children. Okay, rach usually means tender. Mirakech um, is conditioner, both for your hair or fabric softener in, uh, in doing laundry. So rach, or in this case, raka means soft. Okay, soft cheese. Um, you'll see in that list of government subsidized products, there's quite a number of cheeses that are included there. Israel, remember that cheeses, many cheeses, especially European cheeses, um, have a um, uh, have a trademark on their name based on how they're made and or where they're from. And so to get around that, um, many countries will come up with different names for the same cheeses, right? You can't call certain things. You can't, for example, say Parmigiano Reggiano if it's not made from Parmigiano Reggiano region of Italy. So instead, things will be called Parmesan cheese or some other name along those lines, right? In Israel, they've done the same thing, that cheeses that are made in Israel and that are made in the style of trademark name cheeses will have their own names and they'll have their own Hebraicized names. They won't necessarily have anything to do with um, the original cheese it's made of, but it's a trademark name. Think like Kleenex, that we use the word Kleenex for all um, facial tissues, when in fact Kleenex is the name of a company, right? And that list of cheeses that, and dairy products that I included in that list in the, in the chat um, you'll be able to see all the different ones there. That's not all of them, but when you go to the grocery store, you'll often see under it in small letters, it'll say bisignon something. Signon means style. And then it will explain what kind of cheese it really is modeled after. But um, uh, it's, it's, it's a clever way to, for the Israeli dairy companies to make their own branding known um, and we're going to get to actually some of those that are known to this day only in Israel by their Hebrew names, um, as well as get around the global trademarks that are around those specific cheeses. So there's a lot of them. Some of them will be called by their names and, you know, to hell with the trademark that goes around them. And some of them will have unique names. You'll see some of those in that list of cheeses in English and Hebrew. Let's get into some that aren't necessarily readily known or available where you are outside of Israel, or if they are, you may not have even know what they were. So two of them, and just like we had chalav and chalavi and chalbon, all based on the root, the shoresh, chet lamed bet, we have a number of words that are based around the verb, the root, lamed bet nun. Lamed bet nun in Hebrew is white. 
And we see a connection, even though these two words are not Hebrew in origin. Roten Leben and Ro Eleven Labane. You've probably heard of these two things. You probably didn't know what at least one of these were. I'll explain a little bit about it with, again, not going too much detail here. Leben is a product that's unique to the Middle East, to Central Asia, but we're only really talking about the Middle East here. Leben is um, known in Hebrew often by the words eshel or gil that you see here, excuse me, in parentheses. And why is that? Just like Kleenex for facial tissues or Xerox for photocopying machines, eshel and gil are two trademarked names um, for type one company's brand of Leben based on the fat content of what's in them. So one of them is Eshel, one of them is Gil. It depends on how much fat is in it. You'll see it. If you go to the grocery store, you'll see Eshel and you'll see Gil. And you'll see there are two different labels of the same product with a different fat content on it. We'll get to fat in a little bit. Don't worry. We'll talk a little bit about that. Leben is a form of fermented uh, dairy product. It is not the same as yogurt. Um, and that's why I put it specifically here. And I did not put yogurt on this list. Yogurt, by the way, is yogurt. Pretty simple to find what that is. It will be called yogurt if it is yogurt. Leben is best thought of as a um, when you mix milk and sour cream together. And it becomes this very... Um, very liquidy product. It's almost like a uh, thicker buttermilk in that it's very sour. It's a fermented um, uh, product, but it's not the same process of fermentation that yogurt goes under. Again, it's been eaten in the Middle East for centuries. This is probably a product you've seen in many kosher supermarkets um, in North America and the UK that was always sort of there in the dairy section. You didn't know what it was, or if you did have it, you thought it was yogurt, and then, ooh, what is this flavor? It's very sour. Um, that's Leben. Think of it like a more solid buttermilk. Um, people love it. Um, it's considered very healthy. It is very healthy for you, but it's not the same as labane, and it's not the same as yogurt. So heads up if you didn't know what that was in the dairy section. Labane, you've probably heard of, because labane, since the last, certainly the last few years, has skyrocketed in interest around the world, um, because it's known by its very other, another name, which is very familiar, and frankly, the difference between the two is negligible. You also probably know Labanet as Greek yogurt. Now, before everyone jumps on me and says, well, no, no, there's a difference between the two. There really isn't. Greek yogurt, there is no standard of what Greek yogurt is. Greek yogurt, Labanet, they're both strained yogurts. You take a regular plain yogurt, you pass it through a cheesecloth or another piece of fabric so that more of the whey, the liquid comes out. So it's thicker in, in density, in consistency. Um, the real only difference is that here in Israel and the rest of um, this part of the Middle East, Labane is considered a savory product. We'll eat it with um, za'atar and olive oil on top or in a various different ways, but we usually treat it as something savory. Whereas Greek yogurt is often known for breakfast foods, for desserts. It's a more sweet product. It's not to say you can't mix and match the two. By all means, do it. Just know that's usually how it's served. Labane, at least here in Israel, is typically served in the savory context. Greek yogurt, yogurt yavani, is a relatively new product on the um, in the supermarkets here in Israel. Again, the difference between the two is very small. The only difference you'll see when you go to the grocery store is usually Labane is, sir, is um, sold in much bigger containers. Um, you can find it in small ones, big ones. Uh, yogurt Yavani, Greek yogurt is usually only served in um, individual portions and small ones that usually come in multi-packs that you snap off. Um, that's the main difference between the two. Otherwise, in terms of flavor, content, all of that, it's pretty small. But if you'd like to correct me, have at it in the Q&A. Um, but there really is no big difference between Labane and Greek yogurt, except how the context in which they're served and prepared. Okay, we did Chet Lamed Bet, for Chalav, we did Lamed, Bet, Nun, Leben, Labane for those products. Now let's get into the root 
Shin Mem Nun. Shin Mem Nun is a really good one. You're going to see it has a lot of different usages when it comes to dairy products and also foods in general. So let's start with the big one, Shamenet. Shamenet is simply cream. Okay, it's not chalav, it's not chema, which is butter, it's not kvina, which is cheese, it's cream. Now, this is an important one because when you go to the grocery store, you're going to see a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, did I mention a lot, of products that are simply labeled shamenet. You need to discern the difference between them because it's not going to be made for you. Shamenet, if you just see one of those little pack, little um, individual servings, right, that come in a multi-pack that you snap off, and it simply says shamenet, Look in the small print underneath it on the main label, and it will probably say shamenet chamutza. Chamutz means sour. Shamenet chamutza, sour cream. In fact, most of those in those snap-off plastic containers that are usually square or rectangular are sour cream. Okay, and shamenet chamutza is actually one of the um, dairy products that's under pikuach memshalti. It's under government price control. Keep in mind, not only all the different um, ways we use sour cream, but also keep in mind how many olim came from the former Soviet Union, where sour cream is a staple of everyday cooking. Not to mention other cuisines, but especially because of that. Shamenet chamutza, a very specific form in its fat content, you'll see it in that list, is form of that. Now, a few more things about shamenet. There are other products that will say shamenet on them. For example, a lot of the spreadable white cheeses, right? Gvina levana means white cheese. We have a lot of these different types of white cheeses. Um, some of them will say that they are gvina levana bemilkam shamenet, or reverse. Shamenet bemilkam eh, gvina. Eh, shamenet with the texture. Milkam is texture of cheese. This is a spreadable cheese. There's a number of these um, that you'll find. One of the most um, popular ones is a brand name called Symphonia, Symphony, which comes in all sorts of different flavors. If you're looking for Philadelphia style cream cheese, um, you, are, you are sometimes gonna see the word Shamenet. There are um, imposters who try to make a Philadelphia style cream cheese. Um, one of the brands, they call it New York. You can also just buy Philly cream cheese in most grocery stores. Um, in Israel, certainly before holidays like Shavuot, there's a run on it, but you can find it certainly here in Tel Aviv in the 24-hour um, convenience store AM, PM. Okay, Shamenet is overall cream. A few more things about cream, because it's that important and it was a specific question we got with regards to this lesson. Um, number one, the highest fat content you can re readily find here in Israel is 38%. We call that Shamenet Lehak Patsa. You'll see it on the label. It's also one of the government subsidized things. Hakpatsa, lakpitz, comes from the verb likfots, which is to jump. Shamenet lakpatsa is whipping cream. Lakpitz is also to whip, as in to make something jump. Um, so shamenet lakpatsa is whipping cream. You'll also find shamenet lebishul, uh, cooking cream. The highest fat content that you can re readily Understand the word readily, folks. Readily find in Israel, in any given supermarket, readily is 38%. So for the Brits here in the audience, that means double cream. I have never seen it in Israel. If you find it, great. But readily, it is not available above 38%. The flip side of that is the product known as half and half among North Americans and Brits with regards to what you put in your coffee or in other products is also not readily available in Israel. Half and half is a combination of milk and cream. Um, there are recipes online apparently that tell you how to make your own half and half, but in Israel it is not readily available to purchase as in a carton, whether it's a, you know, a liter or half a liter um, or a pint or a quart for those of you who keep standards. Um, it's not readily found, right? If people are putting a dairy product in their milk, in their coffee, rather, it's usually milk of some kind, or they may put shum in it in their coffee. Um, but just know half and half, as you um, may be used to in your countries of origin, is not readily available here in Israel. 
That's a whole lot about chaminet. We use it quite a lot in things, both in savory and sweet um, uh, cooking here in Israel, just like you do in all sorts of uh, cuisines around the world. From that same root, though, shin memnon, we get a lot of other really important words for everyday cooking. First off, the word shemen. Shemen is oil of any kind, whether it's edible, whether it's um, in your uh, cosmetics or in aromatherapy. Shemen is oil. Okay. Um, shemen is oil when it comes to things like this. Um, it's pretty straightforward. From the same root, we also get the adjective shamen. Shamen is fat. Um, shamen, shmena, shmenim, shmenot. Fat as an adjective. Fat as a noun is shuman, right? So again, if you're looking at your nutritional label and you're trying to find the fat content of a product, you're going to look for shuman, okay? And it's usually going to be shuman is going to be the header and under it, it's going to say trans fatty acids and cholesterol. We've done that. Um, again, shout out, we've done that uh, lesson before. You can find it on YouTube. Okay, and from that same root, we also get the word mashmin. Mashmin means fattening, right? If you wanna say, oh, no thanks, um, I can't eat that, it's too fattening. This is the word, it's an, an adjective. It comes from the verb lahashmin, to get fat or to fatten up, right? And we talked about this the other week when we went through verbs, this is the causative form. This is hif'il. Um, so to cause to become shamen, to become fat or fatten, okay? Fattening. Um, this is actually the participle, but it's also an adjective. Something ochel mashmin is a fattening food. Okay, really good word to know. Um, last in our specific words with regards to dairy products is this guy, chufza. Chufza is the word you will probably never hear, much less ever see. You will, however, know this product by its brand name. Um, in terms of Israel and finding it readily available, there is one company that makes it, and it's known by the brand name Rivion, or Rivion, depending on how you say the letter Resh. Rivion, or Chufza, as it's formally called, is buttermilk. Okay, so if you are looking to make buttermilk pancakes or whatever it may be, this is the closest product you will find in Israel to actual buttermilk, chufza, or as its brand name, Rivion. Okay, a few more words, and then I want to take your questions. As I already see we have a bunch of them. These next few words are really important, not just in terms of dairy products, but in general, right? We went through dairy. What about if you have... Issues. What if you have regishut lechalav or regishut lactose? What if you're lactose intolerant? What if you don't consume um, milk or dairy products? What are the words you need to look for? So first off, muashar. Muashar or muashar means enriched. Okay, it comes from the uh, same root, ein shin resh, as ashir, which is the adjective rich. Okay. Or laha ashir, which is to enrich, right? Again, it's hif il. We talked about this the other week, which means to cause something to happen. To cause something to become rich, literally in English, enrich. Simple as that. Hebrew is great like that. Muashal means enriched. So if you're looking for a product that's muashal be vitaminim or im im vitaminim, right? Enriched with vitamins. This is the word you're going to look for. You can find, for example, milk, chalav mu ashal, um, enriched milk with, with extra vitamins or extra minerals, whatever it may be. It's sold and it said very explicitly mu ashal on it, enriched, just like you will in plant-based milks, you'll find that. Or any other food stuff that is enriched with something, this is the word you're going to look for on the label to see if it has any additives in it, mu ashal. Another important word, dal. Dal is used before what um, you want less of. Dal means low. It's best um, translated as low as low dash, right? So low fat milk, chalav dal shuman. If you've been here in Israel long enough or you just love drinking coffee and you 
or um, at your Beit Cafe, you or someone in ear, um, in hearing distance will invariably um, try to order a hafuch chala, hafuch, how would they say it? Hafuch dal shuman, im chalav dal shuman. Hafuch, cafe hafuch, im chalav dal shuman. That is the formal way you would say the whole thing, which is a cafe hafuch with low fat milk. Typically, when you go to a um, cafe that has a high turnover, you simply say hafuch dal. Right? If you, that's what you want, a cafe hafuch with low fat milk. You don't have to say the whole dal shu, chalav dal shuman. You simply say dal. Dal means low fat. Um, a lot of cafes don't serve that anymore. But some will do. And if you're looking for that in the supermarket, you're going to look for dal. Otherwise, you're going to look for the amount of percent of fat that's on, in it. And that will be on the front label. Right? 1%, 3%. Sometimes you can find more percent readily available. Just know dal means low, right? So dal shuman, low fat. Um, anything else that needs to be low is going to be, is going to use the word uh, dal in front of it. Dal lactose. Dal lactose is something you can now more readily find here in Israel. It means low um, lactose milk, right? So it's not lactose free, just has less lactose than um, regular milk does. So for those of you who have issues with um, dairy products, you're going to look for dal lactose, or you're going to look for our next word, natul. Natul lactose would mean lactose-free. Okay? Um, natul is often known in Israel, again, if you're at a Beit Cafe, if you're at a cafe, and you're asking for a cafe, natul caffeine. Natul caffeine, just like we said, natul Shuman means fat-free. Natul caffeine, decaf. Okay, it's caffeine-free. It is bereft of, uh, it is lacking caffeine. Natul caffeine, or someone will simply ask for um, a fuch natul. Right, they'll ask for a cafe hafuch, natul, decaf, decaffeinated. Okay, natul means DE at the beginning of a word or dash free. So, like I said, lactose free, natul lactose, natul caffeine decaffeinated. Okay, a really good word to know. So, if you're looking, if something has a certain element or a product in it um, or ingredient versus one that doesn't, you're going to look for these two words, right? Dal or natul. These are different than the words for without. We've talked about those words a lot, like bli and lelo. This is low or free. Very important distinction, just like we have in English. And finally, another important one is because we're talking about dairy products, we need to talk about non-dairy dairy products, right? All those different plant-based milks that are out there and plant-based solutions, whether you can't um, consume them or you have friends who can't, or you keep um, kashrut and you want to have a um, meal without dairy products, but you want to approximate them, you're going to look for these um, terms. Tzimchi, row 23 here, tzimchi, or minhat somech. You're going to see these obviously a lot, a lot more here in Israel as more and more people choose a um, plant-based diet. Um, they're not going to necessarily use the word vegan. Um, maybe because they're not necessarily a vegan or vegetarian, also because those words have become quite loaded in a uh, sociological way, in a cultural way. But these two words you're going to see a lot on um, labels in Israel when it comes to plant and plant-based products. So tzimchi and minat somer. Both of these come from the same root. As you see here, again, roots are very, roots are destiny in Israel, in Hebrew. Tzadi mem chet um, comes from tzemach, which is a plant. Litzmoach is to um, is to grow. Um, it is one of the things that we say um, for the prayer of the state of Israel. Reshit smichat geulatenu, right? The beginnings of the flowering, the the budding of our redemption, right? So tzimchi or minat somech. Tzimchi, again, it's got that yud at the end, so you know it's an adjective. Tzimchi is plant-based or planty or plantish or plantesque 
if those help you uh, better understand it. And Minat Somer is also the one that you're going to see very often. So for example, not just with plant-based milks, what about plant-based meats, right? What about things like redefined meat or um, fake meat or anything like that? It's often going to say um, on the label, for example, if you're looking for ground um, fake meat, basar tachun minat somer, right? Ground, quote unquote, meat that's plant-based. Okay, so it's something that's approximating ground meat, but it's minat somer, it's from plants. And it's usually a variety of different plants. But both of these words are very important to read if you are looking for something that is either dairy-free or meat-free or simply just plant-based. Tzimchi or minat somer. So if you go to the grocery store, for example, you will find in the same dairy section, shamenet minat somer or shamenet simchit, right? Plant-based cream. Um, if you're going to find a plant-based milk, it'll usually say the type of plant it's from. So if you're looking for uh, almond milk, chalav shkedim. Oat milk, chalav shibolet shual. I'm not going to go through all of them. There's quite a lot now. There's now a chalav, a sumsum. There's a sesame-based one. Um, but you get the picture. Tzimchi, minat sumer are going to be your friends to understand what is in this product. Is it dairy or meat or is it plant-based? Okay, so again, these are words that certainly the expression, the very detailed explanation I gave you of shamenet. Um, you're not going to be able to look up in a dictionary. And um, if your Ulpan teacher does teach you that, good on them. I'd actually love to hear uh, their name because that's a really good one to know. Um, but in addition, supplementing that are all those links that I put in the chat window. It will be up on the YouTube um, video when they go when it goes live in the description of the video so you can access them again. There are a lot of resources out there to help with navigating um, food in Israel because some of it is just not um, familiar. And even with the dictionary, you're just not going to understand some of these things. Okay, let me take some questions as I open this up. Uh, someone asked, is there an English version of the subsidized list or a way to translate web pages shown only in Hebrew? There absolutely is. It's called Google Translate. Um, if you use Google Chrome, it has a, um, a, you can add into it the function of Google Translate, and you'll even just right click on the window if you're using Google Chrome, and it'll say translate in Google Translate, and you'll get an approximation of that. Um, Shelly asks a great question. How do you see and spell conditioner again? Let me write that out, Shelly. Great question. Let me write that down here. I make it big. Just a second. Can't get to it quite yet. Hold on. I see a number of people raising hands and that function uh, is obscuring my ability to make this larger. But by the way, folks, raising hand doesn't help. If you have a question, please write that in the Q&A. Um, that function simply doesn't work here in this webinar, but thank you for raising your hands as polite uh, Ulim. Okay, sorry, it's taking a little bit longer to come up. So let me just do it like this. Great, and let me put that here. View full screen. Me, me, ra, kech. Okay, conditioner. Merakech is conditioner. Okay, merakech. Merakech is conditioner. Like I said, it's also um, if you are in the um, if you are getting soap. For um, laundry detergent, you will also see merakech there. That's fabric softener. It's the same idea. Conditioner softens your hair. Merakech for clothes softens your um, clothes. Um, you can't mix the two up, folks. Don't please don't ask if you will mix them up. They're in two different parts of the supermarket, just like when you go to a supermarket anywhere else around the world. Um, hair products and cosmetics are in one place. Laundry detergent and soap is in another. But great question, Shelly. Thank you for asking. 
Alan asks, can you get kefir in Israel? Yes, Alan, you can, usually in um, natural food stores. There are some um, regular food stores that can, for example, the nationwide chain Tivtam, which is both a grocery st uh, gourmet store, as well as catering to many former Soviet Union immigrants, um, because kefir is very popular among cultures of former Soviet Union. You'll find it there, it's called kefir. It's a pretty simple one. That one you can um, use the same name as. Uh, Lorraine asks, uh, please write the word sour for sour cream. You bet. Uh, Hamutz. Okay. Hamutz, let me do that. And actually, um, I know you will all stay tuned in our next few lessons, but our next lesson on food, which will be in two weeks time, we're gonna talk more about chamutz, a very important word, especially getting ready for Pesach. And I'll explain why if you can't figure out already, I'll leave you in suspense until then. But chamutz, chamutz. Let me make that bigger so you can see. Sour, A, D, J, M, okay. So anything that's sour is chamutz, chamutz, chamutza, chamutzim, chamutzot. So shamenet chamutza is sour cream. Steve asks, katsefet would be whipping cream too. Yes, great question, Steve. Katsefet, if you see a canister, right? One of those aerosol cans that says katsefet, that is whipping cream. That is whipped cream, excuse me. Whipped cream is katsefet. Whipping cream is shamenet lahak patsa, meaning that you do it yourself, right? You all know that to make whipped cream, you beat, a, um, you beat cream together that's at a certain um, fat percentage and it turns into whipped cream. Katsefet is whipped cream. It's the product that comes after that. If you buy it in the store, it comes in an aerosol um, bottle. If it's not whipped yet, it'll come in a little um, uh, paper, um, one of those Tetra Pak uh, containers, and you'll whip it yourself. Okay, great distinction though, great question. Um, let me write it again, just so you all recognize it, as I see that's a common question here. Shamenet lehakpatsa. Sorry, shamenet pehakpatsa. Okay, shamenet lahakpatsa. Shamenet lahakpatsa. Whipping cream. Shamanet lak patsa, whipping cream. Great question. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, David asks a great question. Is it possible to use the word netul for a diet product such as diet free or non-alcoholic too, or is it only used for caffeine free? Um, that's a great question, David. It's only used for caffeine. Um, instead, we're going to use the word lelo for um, uh, alcohol free, meaning without alcohol, right? It's without alcohol, without sugar, lelo sukal, lelo alcohol. Um, is how we're going to say those other ones. Netul caffeine or netul lactose are specific for those items. Anonymous asks, how would you say vegetarian or vegan? Um, anonymous, you can look up those words. They are quickly tzimchoni and tivoni, respectively, but you can look up those words. But thank you for asking. Um, I have to drink plant-based beverages and they usually say mashke shkedim and not chalav shkedim. Is mashke the preferred term? It's a great question. Mashke, I'm going to write this word here. Sorry. We had this word a couple weeks ago, um, but it's a good... Word to go over again, mashke. 
Mashke is simply a drink. Okay, it's a very important understanding. Mashke means a drink. Um, the issue with this word is as follows. Like in other governments, in other countries around the world, you can't call certain things um, milk or juice, for example, which are the two most common ones when it comes to mashke. You can't call things, in this case, chalav, milk, or juice, meats, if it has a certain amount of other additives in it. Usually it's sugar or water or whatever it may be, right? So for example, here in Israel, you will see a lot of bottled, quote unquote, drinks that look like juice, right? You've seen that next to the soda section where it's spring or any of the other um, ones and it's called mashke mango or mashke afalsik, right? Mango drink or apricot drink. Um, often this gets, uh, when it comes to juices are translated as nectar. It's meaning that it's not 100% juice. Right? Certainly if it was 100% juice, it wouldn't be sitting in that kind of container on that part of the grocery store. Same thing with um, a lot of these plant-based drinks, as well as, by the way, chalav muashal. If you buy enriched milk here in Israel, it's usually called mashke chalav muashal, understanding that it's not 100% milk. There's something else in it that makes it enriched, that makes it muashal. Same thing with plant-based milks because it's not milk it's not from an animal it's a product that looks like milk that is used like milk but it's not milk in its government regulated definition okay so whether it's called chalav shkedim or mashke shkedim for almond milk is irrelevant because what you get the liquid that you get from almonds to approximate milk regardless is never going to be animal originating milk. So they're used interchangeably when it comes to plant-based drinks, um, but it's an important distinction to be made, especially if you're getting a dairy product and it says mashke on it, it means it's not 100% milk. There's something else in it. Great question. Um, Carla asks, is chalavi the equivalent of vanilla? Yes, in slang. It's not an everyday... Um, word that's used to mean boring. We have a word for boring. You can all look that up. But in slang, chalavi means vanilla. Like you would say vanilla um, in a slang way, meaning it's kind of boring, even though vanilla can be quite good. Same thing here. Dairy can be good, but it also can be boring in slang. Um, what's the difference between simchoni and tivoni? You can look that up, but again, Simchoni, vegetarian, Tivoni, vegan. You can look those two, up, two words up. If you don't know the difference between vegetarian and vegan, please look that up on your own. Do you know if Labane comes in Dal Shuman? I don't. Usually, um, Labane is not something that you find in Dal Shuman in low fat. Um, I think I've seen three or 5% Shuman, but I don't, off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Okay. Um, okay, we have a couple questions that are a little off um, tangent, but we've gotten to that time of the evening where that's okay. So let me get through as many of these as I can in the Q&A. Um, Judy asks, you said something with shamanit with texture. Yes, let me write the word here. No, come, texture, just do that. Okay, milkam, we use this word in any kind of thing with regards to texture, but that's when you're referring to certain types of dairy products, it'll use this word or any kind of food stuff, frankly, we'll use this in terms of the texture that it um, provides you, excuse me. Um, Lawrence asks, alcohol is mashke, isn't it? No. Again, mashke is the catch-all word for a drink or a beverage. Mashke kharif is an alcoholic beverage. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. You can find that lesson on YouTube. Um, mashke is any kind of drink. General word. 
Um, Vivian asks, when you see the little red spoon, the little spoon of red circles indicating salt, sugar, or fat, does that mean it has an excess of these? Which is the product contains these? Great question, Vivian. Misrad um, Abriyut, the health ministry of Israel, has um, put out these green and red labels on um, foodstuffs um, in Israel, where the government has determined that over a certain amount of um, fat, sugar, and salt is considered unhealthy for a diet, and it's marked as such on the label. So you'll see these. It's a whole um, explanation done by the Misrat Abriyut, obviously in Hebrew. You can look it up, um, and you'll also see it on the nutritional label when it has those things. So usually think things like processed foods with a lot of sodium in it or processed foods that are sugary sweet. Those are the types of products that are going to have those red um, circles on the front label. And on the back label, you'll be able to see what it has. Um, it's a government, um, it's a, an amount that the government has decided upon. And you can see the exact amount if you want on the Misrat Abirut website. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's up to you, obviously, to consume it. It's just advising you that this product contains a high amount of, as you, saw, as you said, um, salt, sugar, or fat. Um, I see people asking about fish. Folks, please look in the chat window. I put a link to a very comprehensive list of fish names, okay? It's a really good resource. There's actually a whole bunch of other food categories on there. Please go to that website. It's a great one there. Um, can goat milk be labeled halav or something else? No, it's halav. Again, if it's 100% milk, it's halav. If it's got something else in it, it's going to be a mashke. Just like it is in English, right? Think of um, uh, those of you who are American or have heard of Sunny Delight and you know that commercial where they are sifting through the um, refrigerator as to what to drink. And they say, and they're looking for it and they look at milk and they go, no, purple stuff in the jug. And they go, no, Sunny D, yeah. Well, first off, Sunny D is actually a mashke. It is not 100% juice. But the purple stuff is also a drink, right? When you go to the grocery store and you see those jugs of brightly colored, what we think are juices, it says on a drink. So grape drink or lemon lime drink. Same thing here with the word mashke. It's a drink in that you can drink it, but it's not juice. Same thing with milks. If it's got something other than milk in it, it is no longer considered milk, it is considered a mashke, right? So think um, think anything that's enriched or chocolate milk, for example, or anything along those lines. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. Um, and so thank you all so much, Todaraba, for joining us tonight um, as this lesson, as well as next we, last week's lesson will be up online in the next few days. Apologies that the previous lesson isn't already up there. Next week, next week we are gonna talk about a topic that many of you have requested about, which is reverse transliteration, right? We you see a lot of transliteration that I do from Hebrew to English. What about the other way? What about non-Hebrew words transliterated into Hebrew? How the heck do you read those words? How do you recognize them? And also what we call in the language world, false friends words that you think you understand what they mean when in fact they don't mean that just because they sound like English or another language. Okay, so really important lesson when it comes to transliteration next week and false friends. I will see you all next week. Thank you all so much and take care. See you all soon.